Yeah. Do that already. Oh, you did. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, what do? For Okay, I think we can begin. Uh, before before we actually before we actually look in the word, let me make a couple of announcements, please. Uh, the first is that our calendar next week on the 14th will be meeting a half hour later because they had another thing scheduled for this room. So we'll meet at 10:30. I hope that doesn't disrupt your schedule too much. Uh, and then uh, Janet Hewn has invited us all, and you have a sheet in front of you, uh, on the 17th, uh, a Saturday, to her home for an agape feast and just some rich fellowship. And uh, I'll be sharing a couple of times in the Word. There's a section of Scripture that is very, very wonderful and it's called the book of Emmanuel, and it's in the book of Isaiah. There's a book within a book. And so we'll be looking at the book of Emmanuel, chapter 7 to 12 in the book of Isaiah. So if you can make that, I hope you can. Uh, as we come to study the Word of God, I want to remind my heart and yours of that indispensable principle of Bible study. And that is total reliance on the Lord. Only God can reveal God. And with all of the reference books available and all of the helps, all of the academics, at the end of the day, we must come as little children before the Lord and just cry out to Him that He would unveil the Lord Jesus to our heart. If you really want to know the Bible, that's the way to study the Bible. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. And that brings us to the verse that I want to share before we look in the Word today. It's from 1 John 2 and verse 27. That one's not on the sheet, but uh, here's what it says. As for you... The anointing which you received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Uh, your hope for understanding anything out of the Word of God does not come from the one who sits in front of you, but it comes from the one who abides in your heart. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. And as the years go by, less and less I'm comfortable with, I, I'm uncomfortable with the title Bible teacher. Uh, I just don't like that because I know who the Bible teacher is. And it's the precious Holy Spirit who lives in your heart. But I also know, technically, that he has given instruments, teachers, to his church. Uh, when we talk about rulers, we talk about delegated authority. In other words, he's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords. And then the kings of earth are just delegated in their authority. And so I suppose if he's king and king and lord of lords, he's also teacher of teachers. And so uh, that it, probably you won't find that in your Bible, but he certainly is that. 
So my hope, uh, there was a time when I got so afraid of teaching, because I was afraid I'd say something wrong, lead someone astray. I almost put it aside. And then I remembered uh, Matthew 5, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be in danger of some things that Ed Miller might say. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't say that. You're safe if you're hungry. You're not going to be led into error if you're hungry. That doesn't remove my responsibility as an instructor, <laughs> but it gives me the courage, the daring, to set before your hearts uh, what I see as the truth of God. But the Holy Spirit will keep you, and He'll protect you. So with that in mind, let's come to the real teacher and ask Him to guide us. Our Father, we thank You so much for Your precious Word, for the one that lives in our hearts, whoever points us to Christ. And You have told us to come to You and to learn of You. Not just facts, but you're the teacher. You're the teacher. You're the curriculum. You're everything. And we just pray that you'd open our hearts again this morning as we look at 2 Corinthians. Thank you that you're going to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'll ask you to turn, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, and I want to sort of... Uh, give an overview of where we are in our study. Uh, we're looking at our precious Lord Jesus once again in the book of 2 Corinthians. And way back, I'm talking about 16 lessons ago, I gave you the plan that I intended to follow. It's not an inspired plan. It's just, I hope it's helpful to you. It's the way that I arranged for my own heart the material in 2 Corinthians. At that time, I told you the book was divided into three big parts. Chapters 1 to 7, which we called In Christ Jesus, that I'm sufficient in Christ. And uh, that's the first seven chapters, and they contained the principles of the new covenant life. In other words, 2 Corinthians is the message of the new covenant, the covenant of grace. I like to call it the exchanged life. I borrowed that expression from Hudson Taylor, and I'm sure he doesn't mind, but that's one of my favorite expressions. There are many ways to say the same thing. We're just talking about the Christian life. Some call it the normal Christian life. Some call it the life hid with Christ in God. Some call it the victorious life. Some call it the higher life. Some call it the abundant life. Some call it the risen life. Some call it the new covenant life. Some call it the spirit-filled life. I like exchange life. It's all the same thing. It's you and Jesus living in fellowship together. That's the Christian life. So we're not going to fight over which title uh, different people use. But as Jesus once died as our substitute in our place, in our stead, he now wants to live as our substitute in our place and instead of us. That's why I like the expression exchange life. Now the Apostle Paul understood that principle of the exchange life more than any person who has ever lived. And therefore he became God's model, God's pattern, God's example. He's the quintessential illustration of the new covenant life. And so as you look at Paul's life, You'll see what your life should look like if Christ is your very life as he was Paul's very life. Second Corinthians has been called the autobiography of the Apostle Paul. Here we see Paul in every way. He makes himself bare. 
we see his heart. And therefore, he is putting on display all of the characteristics of what it means to live the Christian life. And so we've looked together at the first seven chapters, and we've tried to follow Paul and glean from his life those wonderful characteristics of the new covenant life. Now, because we've moved in such an erratic way, I have an idea that some of you have been lost in the woods as far as the the whole outline of Corinthians. We started going through 1 to 7. Then I jumped over chapter 2 because I wanted to get to chapter 3 before the summer. I intended to go back to chapter 2, but chapter 4 followed 3 and 5 followed uh, 4 and so on. So we continued until last week when we went back to chapter 2. Anyway, all of that said, I'm sure some of you have lost the flow and are confused. I guess that because I'm confused too. And so I thought it would be helpful to give a review. Now I've handed out a sheet. And you can see on that page 13 principles that we've already looked at. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go over that now. I I trust you will go over that in your leisure time. But I listed the 13 principles. And in case you wanted a detailed look at that again, a review, I've also listed the number of the lesson. So if you want that tape, on that principle, you can ask Lillian, sweet Lily, she'll be glad to give you the tape. Now, to those who are following this series by tape, uh, if you don't get that sheet of notes, please request it, because it goes with this tape, and uh, we may forget to send it to you, and I just think it would be helpful. Uh, But having said that, we're not going to go over that sheet You just put that away, and that's the principles we've looked at so far. There's one remaining that we will look at this morning, and then as far as our discussion of the first seven chapters, that will complete it. Chapters 8 and 9 are a new section, which, Lord willing, we can take up uh, next week. Now, with that said, let me pick up The last principle we looked at, I want to review it just a little more, and then we'll look at our final principle. 2 Corinthians 2, beginning at verse 14. Thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death, to the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Now, when we close last time, we only looked at verse 14. Thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. That's as far as we got. The new covenant Christian is led in the triumph that belongs to Christ. And according to that passage, at all times and in every place. In other words, the principle is constant victory. At all times and in every place. But our victory is in Christ Jesus. I remind you that it is he who has triumphed. And we are in him. And so if we have any triumph, it's because we're in him. It's very troubling to some Christians. And for me, it was very troubling for many years as I was beginning to enter into some of these things, it's troubling to cry out to the Lord for deliverance from some bondage or some addiction. 
You know, inside we still have uh, so much abiding corruption. And we want to live victoriously. We don't want to sin. And I remember crying out to God for deliverance, and it didn't seem like he answered. There was no deliverance for me. And I remember many times, uh, in one particular case, I, I went into uh, a fast, and I took three days and lived in a closet. And I thought if I stayed in the closet and prayed and fasted, then maybe God would have some mercy on me and hear me. I came out of the closet as defeated as when I went into the closet. Uh, and so thousands of Christians live defeated because they are seeking their own triumph. They're seeking their own victory. They're seeking their own deliverance. And according to this passage, he leads us at all times and in all places in his victory. It's in his triumph. And so the background, as I said uh, last time, the back, if you read chapter 1 and 2, it looks like Paul has anything but victory. He was heavily afflicted. He was being slandered, misunderstood. He was burdened for others, the sin in the lives of others. He had anxieties and frustrations. He actually walked past a door of opportunity that God gave him. He was so burdened, he didn't even go through the door that God opened for him. And so if you look at his life in chapters 1 and 2, he doesn't look very victorious. And yet, after he gives one problem after another, then he says in 2 Corinthians, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. The triumph was not in Paul. And that's the essence of the idea of the exchange life. For years, I thought the Christian life was a change, that God would change me. He didn't change me. I'm the same guy I was before I got saved. I'm not changed. It's an exchange. It's not a change. And I thought, uh, if I'm defeated, God will make me victorious. If I'm inadequate, God will make me adequate. If I'm anxious, God will take away my anxiety, help me to trust. If I'm fearful, he's going to make me brave and courageous. If I'm discouraged, he's going to give me rest. If I have turmoil, he'll put peace in my heart. That's what I thought, but it didn't work. And I tried so many ways to have that happen. But the point is, he is victorious, right? He is sitting on the throne. He's in control. Is he anxious about anything? He's at perfect rest. And he invites us to enter into his rest. He's dead to sin and alive to God. I'm not dead to sin and alive to God. He is. But I'm in Him. And because I'm in Him, I'm dead to sin and alive unto God. Our victory is in Christ Jesus. Uh, John said in chapter 16 and verse 33, These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Take courage, I have overcome the world. Uh, he has never promised to change me. That which is flesh is flesh. It'll always be flesh. Never be anything but flesh. There is no uh, AIS, Adam, old Adam Improvement Society. There is none of that. God's not going to make us better, not going to improve us. But he has offered us a glorious exchange. His life in place of yours. What a glorious thing that is. And it makes sense. God is not going to give us his son and something else called power. His son and something else called peace. His son and something else called victory. His son 
and something else called deliverance. His son, and something else called rest. His son, and something else called healing. He's only going to give us his son. And all these things are in his son. If you have his son, you have everything in him. You have his merits. You have righteousness. You have power. You have peace. It's all found in Jesus. So, that's what we looked at last time. In every place, at all times, I can be triumphant. He leads me in his triumph. Romans 8.32 is a great summary of that. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not with him freely give us all things? The all things are freely given in him. Now, before we leave this, I want to show you how it begins. 2 Corinthians 2.14, thanks be to God. It begins with thanksgiving. And why? Because we're studying the new covenant. And you remember what the new covenant is. The new covenant is grace. And grace is undeserved. It's a gift. It's undeserved. If you receive a gift, it's natural to say thank you. If I receive... Good morning. Good morning. If I receive a gift... It's natural to say, thank you. And so he says, thanks be to God. Everything about the new life is a gift. The Apostle Paul knows there is no victory in Paul. God discovered that to him. He knows there's no deliverance in him. He knows that there's no triumph in him. Uh, Paul would be beating his head against the wall to try to triumph over the abiding corruption in his own life, in his own strength. But the glorious revelation that there is an exchange and he can be in Christ Jesus, that filled his heart with thanksgiving. Paul enjoyed constant victory in all places at all times, and it was because he was in Christ Jesus. The more a person enters into the exchange life, the more a person enters in to this idea that Christ has victory, I have Christ. Christ has authority. I don't have any authority. Christ has authority, I have Christ. He lives in me, so all the authority of God lives in me. Everything is a gift. And the more you enter into that, the more thankful you will become. I think thanksgiving and humility are just opposite sides of the same coin. I know I am nothing. I have nothing. I can give nothing. I know He is everything. He has everything. And life is found in him. And so because he now lives in me, my heart is filled. All I can do, fall on my face, say thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's how this begins. Thanks be unto God who always leads us in his triumph. Now, the final principle that I want us to look at is in verses 14 to 16. Let me read that again, chapter 2. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. We're a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death, to the other, an aroma from life to life. And who's adequate for these things? Now, I want to get to the Bible principle, but before, it's like the guy who said, uh, before I teach, I want to say something. (laughs) So before I get to that principle, 
I want to back off and give you another principle that's connected with Bible study. It's a Bible study principle. And you'll see how this verse ties into this principle. As many of you know, the Lord has given me a wonderful library. I thank the Lord for the resources he's given me. Uh, just in 2 Corinthians, I have more than 50 commentaries just on 2 Corinthians. And so I have a wonderful library that God has given me. And I also have many books that are not in the Bible, but they're about the Bible. The background of the Bible. Uh, outside sources. Uh, in other words, uh, mentioned the, the things not mentioned here, but the culture in which they live, the time in which they live. Uh, for example, uh, how did they conduct their marriages? Well, I have books that would give you all of that background. Uh, how do the Jewish people celebrate Passover and tabernacles and some of the feasts? I have background books on that. What's the cultural difference uh, that would help me understand what they were talking about and what they were saying? What is the needle's eye? What's the relationship between New Testament engagement and their marriage, for example? Who were the Essenes? Who were the Herodians? Uh, who were the Sadducees? All the background of all of that. What is Roman law? Uh, what are the laws of the synagogue? When did the synagogue begin? All of that kind of stuff. Many, many books give you the probable background of New Testament times and Old Testament times. Now here's the principle. There are some people who actually teach. They say this. That you've got to have that extra biblical source if you're going to accurately interpret Scripture. In other words, if you don't have that background, certain things here are just dark. And you don't understand them until you get that background. Uh, when, Unless they say uh, you know that there is an opening in the Jerusalem wall called the needle's eye that a camel has to be uh, removed all of the stuff he has to get on his knees and crawl under it then you can't understand Jesus statement unless uh, it's easier for uh, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven they say you've got to have that background. And you've got to understand the background of how uh, coals of fire were used for firewood. Or you're not going to understand when Jesus said, if you're kind to your enemy, you'll put coals of fire on his head. Because they used to carry the firewood on their head, and it was an act of kindness, and so on. And so they, they give you that, and they say, you need that. You can't understand the parable of the wedding feast without understanding the background of the wedding and the attendance of the bride and the attendance of the groom and the period of time that they had and the sudden appearance of the groom. And th that is what helps you understand this. And my question is, is that true? Does God expect every Christian to have all of those resources so that they can come to the Bible and understand the Bible? How important is it to know how the rich were buried? How important is it to understand the path that the Jews took to avoid Samaria. All of that background. What do I need to know about Jacob's well and Rachel's tomb and the pool of Siloam? And do I have to have background to know where Golgotha is and, and about the Garden of Gethsemane? Does God expect Christians to have all of that background? Now the reason that I'm bringing this up at this point is because 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16, I've listed it, but I'm not going to read it here, uh, 
is interpreted by many of my 50 or more commentaries in terms of the background. Now, I don't know if you've heard of the background. I'm about to give it to you, and I'll come back to the principle. The background is that victorious march of the Roman general after a great victory. Some say that was the most splendid, the most dramatic spectacle in New Testament days. It's called the Roman Triumphus. The Roman Triumphus. Uh, supposedly, the victorious army, after they won a battle, uh, they would celebrate the conquering general who would be met by all the citizens of Rome. They'd be cheering on the sidelines and they'd be dancing and so on. And a, a victory parade would be held. In fact, every time there was a victory parade, uh, the Romans declared it a holiday a national holiday, and so the, all of Rome gathered for this wonderful parade. A huge procession would go right through the center of Rome and up to the temple of Jupiter, where they would offer sacrifices of thanksgiving to their gods for giving such a victory. Uh, as I said, the, the route would be lined with cheering spectators. And the general would be leading the conquered enemy in chains. Those they had captured would all be in chains. It's very graphic. Here's what the parade looked like, according to the background. Leading the parade, there would be the magistrates and the important dignitaries and the senators of Rome. And right behind them, there would be carriages laden with the spoils of victory the spoils that they had taken uh, from the, the conquered enemy. And then behind them, there'd be another group of incense sprinklers. They would sprinkle incense as they went, and that smell would go up, and uh, people on the sidelines, they would love that smell, because that's the smell of victory. But those who were in chains being led to their execution, that same smell wasn't a good smell. That was a foul smell. For them, it was the smell of death. And then right behind the incense sprinklers, there would be the general, the one who had led the victorious army, and he would be in a carriage drawn by four white stallions. And he would be going forth, and behind him, and chained to his chariot would be a whole parade of people who were, who were chained. They had chains on their feet and chains on their hand. And these were those who had been conquered. This is the vanquished captives. And they would make their way through Rome and up to the temple of Jupiter. All right, so having said that, people come to this verse and say, the Apostle Paul had that figure in mind when he wrote this chapter. Now, the question is, did he? I'm not so sure. Maybe he did, I don't know. But if he did, this is true. That the reality is always greater than the picture that represents it. So if, it, if that illustrates the truth, the truth is far greater because Jesus is a greater conqueror than uh, any conqueror that Rome ever saw. The problem with interpreting the passage in terms of that particular background, it confuses the text. You say, how so? Well, let me just give you a couple of examples from my commentaries. One of my comments, not one, several of my commentaries say the Christians are represented by the cheering Romans on the sideline. Others say, no, that's not the Christian. The Christians are represented by the captives in chains because Jesus has conquered us and he leads us in his triumph. And we're the ones who are conquered. And others say, no, 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 no. The Christians are the incense sprinklers. 
They're the ones that are proclaiming the victory by sending forth that incense. And others say, no, you're missing the point. The Christians are those riding in the chariot drawn by four stallions, riding along with the conqueror because they are in Christ Jesus. And so my question is, uh, does that background help you understand this particular scripture? Uh, here's the principle of Bible study I want to give you. And it has to do with extra biblical sources. Extra biblical sources may serve as an illustration. But it can never serve as interpretation. You cannot use an extra biblical source to interpret any passage of scripture. Extra biblical information may illustrate it, but you need to understand it by relying on the Holy Spirit. Everything you need to know about the Bible is in the Bible. And so any background necessary is in the Bible itself. So if God says, the word of the Lord came to Isaiah in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, you might want to study the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And where will you find that? In the Bible. And so the book of Acts is the background for all these wonderful epistles. Everything you need to know is in the Bible itself. And if you use extra biblical sources to interpret scripture, I'm afraid you're going to miss the heart of God over and over and over again. God in these days are calling us to be men and women of one book. One book. You don't need all of that extra stuff. Now don't go overboard as I did. I had a whole shelf of these extra biblical things. And when God starts showing me this, I took the whole shelf and I threw all my books into the dump. <laughs> to the chagrin of Lillian. Because then I had to go out and buy them again. <laughs> when I put my head on straight. And she's so sick of me getting rid of books. I got one set of 36 books. And I bought it three times. I, I keep throwing it away or giving it away. I love it. I hate it. And <laughs> Lillian said, last time, you're not doing it again. Anyway, having said that, I would like to come to this particular passage. And let's set the background aside. Just... Maybe later, come back, see if it illustrates it. But let's set that aside, and we'll look at this passage in the light of the Word itself. And I think maybe God will really help us. Now, the Roman triumphus might illustrate something here. Uh, I'll, let, I'll leave that to you. But don't put a lot of weight on extra-biblical sources. I'm telling you. Uh, illustrate? Maybe. Interpret? Never, never. You have in your heart the Holy Spirit, and you have before you on this book everything you need. And so may God help us with that. All right, uh, let me focus. Chapter 214, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. Once again, I want to call attention to always and in every place. Let me turn this tape over. Boy, where'd that time go? All right. oh, I can't even put the tape in. All right. <clears throat> always and in every place. Now, the first application we gave last time, at all times and in every place, to illustrate constant victory. But there's another application to at all times and in every place. It's not only constant victory, but verse 14 shows at all times and in all places is also constant ministry. 
constant ministry. The second half of the verse, and manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Some Christians are always on the lookout for ministry. What can I do? How can I serve the Lord? I'll give. I'll go. I'll sing. I'll drive. I'll serve. I'll pray. I'll try to discover what my spiritual gift is and, and then develop it so I can be used to edify the body of Christ. The New Covenant Christian never stops ministering. I don't have to look for a ministry. At all times and in all places, the New Covenant Christian is ministering. Now, with that as background, uh, you may have guessed that our final principle in these seven chapters has to do with ministry at all times and in all places. Now, I'm going to take it apart by asking and trying to answer, God assisting, four questions about ministry. Number one, the first question, what is ministry? according to this passage. 2 Corinthians 2, 14, and manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. We are a fragrance of Christ to God. Ministry is pleasing the heart of God. That's ministry. Pleasing the heart of God. And no matter what I do that I call ministry, if I haven't pleased the heart of God, I haven't ministered. No matter what you do, even if you call it ministry, if you haven't ministered to his heart, you have not ministered at all. Now what pleases the heart of God? Well, we're not left to guess. At his baptism, Matthew three sixteen. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lightning and lighting on him. And behold, a voice uh, out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What pleases God the Father? And the answer is, his beloved son pleases him. At the transfiguration, Mark 9, 7, a cloud formed overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Jesus' prayer before he went to the cross, John 12, 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven, I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Isaiah gives a messianic prophecy. Prophecy of Messiah. Isaiah 42.1 Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. In eternity past, when there was only the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Before anything was created, Proverbs chapter 8 describes that time. You want to read that. Wisdom speaks, and wisdom is Christ. It's personified, and so it's Jesus. In Proverbs 8.30, Jesus says, I was beside him as a master workman. I was daily his delight. Paul's description of Jesus' relationship to his Holy Father God in Colossians 1.13. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transformed us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. And in my version, in the margin, it says literally, the Son of his love. The Son of his love. God is pleased with Jesus. 
ministry is pleasing God with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 2.14, we are filled with the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him. That's what the new covenant life's all about. Knowing Him. Knowing Him. Uh, I, I forgot what assembly we were in. Might have been in church, might have been here. But I remember Brother Lou said, uh, can we just sing that little chorus, I keep falling in love with him? All right, pitch us. Somebody. <laughs> Go ahead, Gary. I keep on falling in love with him, falling in love with him. Over and over again, I keep falling in love with him. Over and over and over and over again, he gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over again. Did you notice as you fall in love with him, he gets sweeter and sweeter? That's the aroma. And that's ministry. You say, what's my duty? Fall in love with Jesus, and he'll get sweeter and sweeter, and that'll rise up to God, and there's nothing more pleasant in the nostrils of a thrice holy God than Christ coming up from a Christian's life. And that's what true ministry is. The perfume, the fragrance, the savor, according to this passage, is the knowledge of Him. The sweet fragrance of the knowledge of Him. And that's what ministry is. It's pleasing God by offering up the only thing that pleases Him, His beloved Son. The son of his love. The one in whom daily is his delight. There's no sweeter smell to God than Jesus. Ministry is pleasing the heart of God. I've heard some Christians sigh with relief that they're not under the old covenant system. That they had to bring a lamb every time they messed up or they sinned. They say, what a burden that would be, especially since I sin so much. Uh, I have to keep bringing that lamb every day to the altar with a lamb. Uh, in one sense, it is a burden. But dear Christian friends in Christ, don't think, please, for one lonely moment that God has changed and you're no longer under the sacrificial system. You're under it as much as those who lived at the time of the Old Covenant. You say, well, then what's the difference? The difference is they brought the picture, the animal lamb. You don't bring the picture. You bring the reality, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But we are as much required to present to God the lamb. Daily. And that is what pleases him. We are under the sacrificial system, but we're not under the pictures anymore. Now we bring the glorious reality. We bring Christ himself to the heart of God. That's ministry. The second question, to whom do we minister? Once again, verse 15. We are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To whom do we minister? First, vertically, to God. Second, horizontally, to others. To those who are saved and to those who are not saved. Now did you notice that the primary direction of ministry is to God? And then as a byproduct, it's also to men. You see how the incense sprinklers illustrated that. Uh, we offer 
as a sweet fragrance to God. We offer the knowledge of Christ. We're knowing Him. And that's a perfume. And we bring that to God. And as it rises from our life to God, others smell it. They can't help but smell it. And so we're not ministering to them. We're ministering to God. We're offering Christ to God. But the the perfume, the the aroma permeates our circle of influence. And everyone around us is also smelling that wonderful fragrance. The aroma of Christ that comes from us is first of all to God. Now to some, that's a pleasing smell. Uh, they see our new covenant lives and they say, praise God. God for that person on the earth. Praise God for someone that loves Jesus that much, who is just constantly offering Christ, just knowing the Lord and blessing the heart of God. And that aroma to those who are saved and going on in salvation is very desirable, very pleasant. And we cheer and we say, praise God for that. But notice verse 16. To the one, an aroma from death to death. The other, an aroma from life to life. As you live unto God by offering Christ, not everybody is pleased with that. Some people smell that life and it's foul. To them, they don't understand it. The preaching of the cross to those who perish is foolishness. And they think you're throwing your life away. And they don't understand it. Now death, the idea of death is separation. And they can't separate themselves far enough from you. Because you're odd. And you're peculiar. And you're weird. And they think you're stupid. And uh, wh what do you mean you don't uh, cheat on your income tax? How dumb can you be? And, and that's their idea. They just don't get it. And so this idea, they just want to separate from you and from God. But we have, you know, we all this talk about the separation of church and state. They've changed it in their minds. It's the separation of, of state and God, not church. It, it's God. That, and they're against the Lord. So to whom do we minister? Primarily to God. And then as a byproduct... Yeah, we minister to people too. But that's not the direction of our ministry. I want to stress this a little more because usually when we think of ministry, we don't think of it the way God has recorded it. Usually we think, uh, I want to minister, I want to serve people, I want to serve others, I want to serve nations, and we want to reach the world for Jesus. But ministry is not primarily horizontal. Ministry is primarily a fragrance of Christ to God among men. Not to men, to God among men. The fragrance of Christ ascends to God and men also have a benefit. We just sort of read this la la la. Uh, do you realize this? Now, this may sound radical, but, oh, I believe it with all my heart. God has never called Ed Miller to be a soul winner. And he's never called any Christian to be a soul winner. He's called Ed Miller to be a sweet savor of Christ to God. And he's called every Christian to be a sweet savor. Savor of Christ to God. Will that lead to soul winning? Oh, indeed it will. But the direction is different. We've got to set our hearts to minister unto God. A picture of a missionary, for example, who spent, say, 40 or 50 years of his life in a very difficult missionary situation. Let's say he's gone to a hard, hard mission field and he's been ministering to Muslims for 40 years. I say that because that's a hard mission field. And then let's say after 40 or 50 years, he can't point to one Muslim 
who has come to Christ through his ministry. Some would say, what a waste of 40 or 50 years. What good did 40 or 50 years do? And the answer is, it did good to God. It did good to the Lord. In every place, at all times, during that 40 or 50 years, if he was knowing Christ, he was ministering to the heart of God. To say that that man had no ministry or his ministry failed is so wrong. His ministry didn't fail because he blessed the heart of God. Ministry is always to the heart of God. And so we look at success and how many come, how many say yes, how many uh, join the church or come forward in a meeting. That's not the way to measure success. The measure success, you say, how often is God pleased? How often is God happy? And that is ministry. Now, on the other hand, the other side is also true. If someone dedicates their entire life to helping others, here or on some distant shore, and they haven't been knowing Christ, their 40 or 50 years is a waste. And no matter how many people they've ministered to, they haven't really ministered to anybody. Because ministry is ministering to the heart of Christ. First to God, and then as a byproduct, to others. So what is ministry? It's pleasing God by offering him Christ. To whom do we minister? Primarily to God and as a byproduct to everybody else. Uh, here's the third question. Uh, what is the chief way that one Christian can minister to another Christian? Once again, let me read the verses. They're so precious. Beginning at verse 14. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. We are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to the one an aroma from death to death the other an aroma from life to life. Who is adequate for these things? Uh, many Christians think that the best way to minister to a fellow Christian is by ministering to a fellow Christian. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, uh, if I want to minister to you, then the idea is I will have to meet some need that you have, whether it's physical or spiritual. If I give a financial gift, maybe I've ministered to you. Or if I cook a meal, or if I drive you where you can't drive yourself, or if I help you with something that you can't do by yourself, or if I come and pray with you, or, or read a scripture to you, or, or just sit with you, then I've ministered unto you. Uh, the fact is, the best way, and I'm, I'll now limit it to those in this room. If you want to minister to Ed Miller, don't give me a million dollars. Really, I don't want your million dollars. You want to minister to me? You minister to me by ministering to him. If I see you entering into the exchange life, if I see you abiding in Christ, trusting the Lord. If I see you offering Christ to God as a sweet savor, I smell that and I am ministered unto. The best way to minister to me is to have you minister to him. Amen. The best way to minister to each other is to encourage others to minister to him and then we will be ministered unto that's the way to really minister and so when i see your life filled with the knowledge of christ uh, oh how that blesses my soul and i hope it blesses your soul the other way around one final question then we'll end and it's from chapter 216 
who is adequate for these things? This is an inspired question. Uh, it's a rhetorical question, and the answer is obvious. No one is, is adequate for these things. But usually when we think of adequacy, we think of the power to do. I'm not adequate to perform. I'm not adequate to do what's required of me. But in this context, he's not talking about that. And he'll bring it up again in chapter 4, uh, wh where he talks about the adequacy is not of us, but of God. Uh, it's primarily what he's saying here. Uh, we're not adequate, these things. And, and in the original, it's it, to source these things, to come up with these things, to think these things. In other words, the gospel is so wonderful. He's not saying we're idiots in our intelligence. We're really dumb. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying this gospel, this exchange life, this message of the new covenant, it didn't originate with man. It didn't come out of our peanut brain. We could not figure this out. This was out of our reach. There's no possible way. I could not devise a plan to tell a man in ruins a way that he could be restored again to God and reconciled to God. There's no way I could have come to a person who was bowed down with the guilt of his sin and come up with a plan to say, you don't have to be guilty anymore. Man can't think of that. There's no way I could have come up with an exchange. Here's the best way to have victory over the devil, the world, and the flesh. Have somebody live in your place. I could never think of that. Nobody could ever think of that. I can't tell you how to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But I'm telling you, because my adequacy is from God. He's the one that made known these things unto us by His Spirit. And that's why it's all in terms of this ministry. He has made us adequate as ministers of the new covenant. We now have this great message to share with everybody. And not that it came out of us. Not that we have the power to deliver it. We have no adequacy in ourselves. Our adequacy is from God. What is ministry? It's ministering Christ to the heart of God and blessing Him. Does He have socks? Out of His socks. Every time we lift Jesus to Him, God is blessed. To whom do we minister? First to Him, and as a byproduct to everybody else. What's a chief way that you can minister to me and I can minister to you? And the answer is, set your heart on Christ. And when you minister to Him, you've ministered to others. And finally, who is adequate for these things? Nobody. Nobody. Praise God, He has made us adequate as messengers of the new covenant. All right. As far as I'm concerned, that completes our look at chapters 1 to 7. Christ in me. We now begin chapter 8 and 9, Christ through me. And then we'll look at 10 to 13, Christ for me. And then we'll finish the book. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your precious word. And we just pray, Lord, that you might make us adequate as ministers of the new covenant. Not only to live it, but to live it in such a way that you are blessed and the world is reached. Thank you that you're going to work that in us. In Jesus' name, amen.